Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. As believers in Messiah Yeshua, we are called disciples. Now, another word to understand that term disciple is simply a student. It means one who learns. And we need to train ourselves on how to learn the Word of God, to read it more effectively. Therefore, when we pick up a, a piece of Scripture and read it, there are things that we should be reading for, things literally that the Word of God uses to convey to us spiritual revelation, the truths of God. And one of our objectives in this study is to help us learn how to rightly understand the Word of God and the clear clues that the Word of God gives us to rightly understand it. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 2. We began our study of the Psalms last week, and I mentioned to you that one important characteristic for Hebrew poetry and the Psalms are indeed poetry. One important characteristic is parallelism. And I mention that in this second Psalm, we are going to see many examples of what I mean by parallelism. And it's when we recognize this trait, when we understand how to use it, it is going to make the reading of the Word of God much more effective we're going to be able to glean more from our study, our interaction with the text. So look with me, if you would, to Psalm number 2, and we're going to see that this is a messianic psalm, meaning simply, this psalm reveals a great deal of truth concerning the Messiah. One thing that we're going to see immediately is that the world is going to be against Messiah. It speaks about his first coming, but also there's an emphasis in Messiah being established as king, king over this world. And that there's going to be, and don't miss this, there's going to be much resistance to his kingship. In the same way that there was much resistance, when he came the first time as that, that humble figure, that one who came riding upon a donkey, a suffering servant, one who blessed people, ministered to people, loved people, but nevertheless, he was rejected. And that shouldn't surprise us because those who belong to the world, they will always, always, always reject spiritual truth. Because spiritual truth is related to the kingdom. They're connected to this world, but disciples, true disciples, we are connected to the kingdom. This psalm destroys the view that the congregation of the redeemed, that is the church, that it's going to be successful in establishing justice and righteousness and peace in the world. Those who teach that before Messiah returns that we're going to be triumphant in bringing the world to faith, this is a false teaching. No, when Messiah returns, the world is going to be strongly opposed, hostile to his truth, his presence, and his purposes. So let's begin Psalm 2 and verse 1. Now, it's very easy to see the parallelism. Look at verse 1. Why 
rage the Gentiles. Now, we have to pay attention to word order. We have the phrase, and I'm not going to try to read a lot of the Hebrew, but notice it says, Lama Rakshu Goyim. And this word Rakshu, it is in the past, and it's a question. The word Lama is why. So why, in most English translations, use the word rage. It is a word of emotion, and certainly here we have a word that speaks to one being extremely emotional. This has to do with something that, that gets to the heart of a matter, a matter that is very sensitive. And the nations, they do not want what this psalm is about. This psalm speaks about Messiah being anointed as king in this world. See, if Messiah was only the king in the heavens and there's a separation, then the world wouldn't care about that. Think about Pontius Pilate. What did he ask? Is your kingdom of this world? See, if Messiah said, no, it's a, it's a kingdom that has nothing to do with this world. I'm going to take people out of this world and just leave this world alone. He wouldn't care. But it's a kingdom that, that brings about great change in this world, it transforms it, and we'll see it. And therefore, the Gentiles, and one of the ways that we can see this is those who have no covenant hope, no covenant relationship with God. So the Gentiles, they are going to be raging. It says, why rage the Gentiles? And, and then the next word is the word Leum, Leum, it's in the plural, Leumim, which is nations. Now, sometimes the word Goyim can be nations, and it's parallel, meaning this. We see the relationship here between Gentiles and nations. Some will say nations and peoples. That's okay as well. But you see the close relationship. It's a synonym. We have the term leum and the word goy, meaning more or less the same thing, synonyms. But notice what it says about the, the nations or the people. They, and this next word, yegu, it is a word that speaks about deep meditation, meaning that this is a sensitive matter. We saw this. And therefore, they are giving that great thought. They are pondering they're meditating upon that but the last word is reek which is empty or vain futile so this opposition and this is what the scripture does it foreshadows opposition against messiah yeshua that is jesus christ so why rage the the gentiles or the nations and why do people why will they meditate and their meditations are reek are empty meaning all of these feelings all of these thoughts are going to come to nothing now move on to verse 2 yet yatsvu malche eretz which means and will take a stand they will take a stand who's the subject we'll keep reading malche eretz the king's of the earth they will take a stand and then we have por, pl, 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 parallelism where it says ve rosnim what are rosnim they are noblemen so we see the parallelism between the kings of the earth and the noblemen well the kings of the earth they will take a stand and therefore the noblemen what will they do well it says and they, most Bibles will say, took counsel together. But the word for taking counsel, the root is the word yesod, which means to lay a foundation. So they take a stand, they set their foundation against. Now, why do I say against? Well, all of this action, let's go back up. When we look at the subjects, we find that, that they are raging, that they are 
pondering. They're pondering this meditation will serve no purpose. They are taking a stand. They're laying their foundation. And all of this action that the nations and peoples and kings and rulers or noblemen, everything that they're doing is against, and once again, parallelism, against the Lord. Now, it's literally al Hashem, which means concerning. But the context is, yes, they're doing this in regard to concerning God's plan. But the context tells us, and this is why most Bibles rightly render it against. So their actions regarding the Lord, they are against the Lord. And notice, and concerning or against his Messiah, his anointed one. Now, again, parallelism shows things that are, are equal. For example, Goyim, nations or Gentiles, are parallel to nations or peoples. We also see that rage is related to parallel to meditating upon something. We find that kings of the earth are parallel to noblemen, and taking a stand is parallel to laying a foundation together, working together to be against. And what's so important here is at the end of verse 2, we have the phrase, Al Hashem ve'al Mishicho. What does this mean? There's parallelism between the Lord, yud heh and His Messiah. In the same way we see equality between the nations and the peoples, between the kings of the earth and noblemen. We see parallelism in equality between the Lord and his anointed one, his Messiah. This fact, when we look at the indicators of the text, it shows a, a, a relationship, an equality, a unity, a similarity between the Lord and his Messiah. Move on to, to verse 3. Now, here we're going to see that the kings of the earth, who we talked about in the previous verse, and also these noblemen, notice that they are speaking. And what are they doing? Verse 3, let us cut off their bands. And let us send forth, cast forth from us their courts. Now, it's talking about those who are under these leaders' authority. And what are they going to do? Well, you see a similarity, do you not, a parallelism between when it speaks about bands and courts. These are these things that bind people. And what we're finding here is that these leaders, what the text is inferring is that they are going to unleash, they are going to send forth those under their authority and they're going to act, they're going to behave against the purpose of God. All of what this does is to show a future conflict between God's purpose, the Lord's purpose with his anointed one. And what is this psalm leading to? Him being established as king in this world. Him being enthroned. His rule being placed into effect. Now, he's always the king of kings. But there is a major difference in how this world is going to be. Now, it's a world of darkness. It's a world, world that's contaminated with sin. When we look at the judges and the rulers, we see injustice. We see corruption. We see war and hardship. We see this world under a curse. But when Messiah begins to rule, when he is enthroned as the king over all the earth, there's going to be a change. We learn that, for example, in our study from Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9 that he is going to establish an eternal kingdom 
with justice and righteousness for all. One that he will rule over, the government will be upon his shoulders. And these leaders, they stand in opposition to that. And they take counsel, they plot, and they unleash all of their resources to oppose the purpose of God. So this tells us that the world is not going to be brought into obedience to the things of God by the, the success of the congregation of the redeemed. Look now to verse 4. Yoshev Bashemaim Yitzchak, which means one who sits in the heavens. Who is this one that sits in the heavens? We're going to see emphatically. There's only one answer, and the text tells us, but let's read the verse. One who sits in the heavens, he will laugh. Now, he is not seeing this as some threat, some major battle to be dealt with. He'll deal with it simply by speaking. In fact, we know from the book of Revelation, when Messiah comes, returns the second time, not speaking about our blessed hope or the rapture, but his second coming to earth. He is going to speak, speaks about the sword of his mouth, and he'll just speak, and the enemies will be defeated. It's simple for him. And that's why we know that one who sits in the heavens, he will laugh. And what's parallel in this, this verse, verse 4, with Yosheb Shemaim? There's only one answer. What's parallel is Adonai. That's the word we have here, speaking about the Lord. And what's parallel with the phrase Yitzchak, meaning he will laugh? Well, this next phrase, Yilag Lamo, he will mock them. And this is what this word means, and it tells us simply, that, that for God, all of their actions, all of their preparations, all of their strength, all of their resources, God, he will act. And in the same way that, that a lion can toy with a mouse, so too will the God of over all creation, he will simply mock those who are opposed to him. They do not pose a legitimate threat. And that's why it's so sad and we're getting ahead of ourselves. But when we look at the end of the millennial kingdom, when Satan is released and Satan does what he always does, and that is to lie, he speaks deceit. When he goes forth to the four corners, and that means every direction, every place, and, and speaks to those who are in the millennial kingdom, those primarily who were born in the millennial kingdom. He'll say, come with me. We don't have to take this kingdom of justice and righteousness. We don't have to submit to his authority. We can defeat it. And God laughs at such a thought. Because when we look at that text, what happens? There's no great battle. There's not some major conflict that God just at the end is able to, to squeeze out a victory? No, God just commands, fire comes down to heaven and consumes them in an instant. There is no real battle. God, God cannot be fought against. God simply speaks and the opponent, his enemy, is no more. No more here, but eternally in judgment. Now, verse Verse 5, then he will speak unto them in his anger. So we find that God is angry against those who, who want to thwart his purposes, who stand against Yeshua, him being received as king of kings and the Lord of lords. So, verse 5, then he will speak unto them with his anger. And with his anger, it's simply a different word, but it means anger. Some might say wrath. 
whatever your Bible translates it, they will be, what will happen? He will terrify them, disturb them. They will be afraid. This word in modern Hebrew has to do with, with usually scaring someone by surprising them. And this is important because when God moves, when God says enough and his anger goes forth into action, the world is going to be surprised by this. They're doubting him. They're scoffing at those who believe in a God who is going to set up a kingdom upon earth. And it's so sad today that there's a growing percent, perhaps even a majority of those who say, I'm a disciple of Christ, that do not believe that Messiah is going to set up a kingdom in this world. They want to spiritualize the text. They want to symbolize everything into something else. And let me warn you, and I've said this before, when you use that methodology for interpreting the scripture, you can make the Bible say about anything because you become the sole authority of how that should be understood symbolically. What is the spiritual implication of of that what is and people will talk about having a christ-centric viewpoint for interpreting the scriptures now that sounds great but but it's usually used that term christ-centric perspective for interpreting the scripture means usually this we reject the literalness of the word of god in order that we can twist the scripture into fulfilling our doctrines that that literally the word of God does not confirm, does not speak to, do not not proclaim. So God says here, he will speak unto them with his anger and with his wrath, he will scare them, terrify, and or disturb them from their, their purposes, their objectives. And how is he going to do that? Well, look at verse six. Now, remember, I shared with you that this is an enthronement psalm. This is to put a king into power, to set him upon the throne. So it's like a coronation. And that's why we read in verse 6, Ve'ani nasachti malki, which means, and I. There's no debate here. The one who is speaking is God the Father. And he says, I, and it's in the past, and that can mean in its entirety, absolutely, completely. God is going to do something. And he uses a word for pouring. And many times when a king was put into power, remember David says, I'm not going to to raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. He was anointed. The king had oil poured over him. And it was that anointing that that caused him to be recognized as the king. And this is the same word that's used here. So, and I, this is God the Father. I have anointed. I have poured out my anointing upon who? My king. Upon Zion, upon Zion, my holy mountain. Now here again, those who deny a millennial kingdom, they all want to say, well, this anointing, it's spiritual, it's symbolic, it's not going to be done in Zion. Zion is a synonym for Jerusalem, but the kingdom, a kingdom Jerusalem, when Messiah is ruling. So Jerusalem is today, but when redemption has been established in its fullness and Messiah is anointed king, Jerusalem will be known as Zion. Zion has to do with marking something for the excellency of God. And the problem is many want to say, oh, this is heaven. This has nothing to do with the earth, with with the literal city, of Jerusalem, 
But he says here, my holy mountain. That is that temple mount. But here again, people want to deny that and say, oh, this is, this is heaven symbolically. Well, all of this distorts the revelation of the text. Verse 7. Asapura el chok. Chok is a law, a statue. And what we need to see here is that God is proclaiming, he says, I will tell. And the implication is, I will proclaim a law. And what is this law? Look on. Hashem Amar Alai. The Lord has said unto me. Who's the me here? Well, it changes. Because the me refers to Messiah. For the Lord has said unto me, Baini Ata, my son are you. Now, this is pretty, pretty clear that we're dealing with God who is speaking and God is anointing his son. And this son is the king of kings. He's the anointed one. So he is Messiah. And he says, and I today, Hayom, I this day have beget you. Now, this word beget, it's a word in the form yalad, which means to give birth. And the point is this, birth is not conception. This word for giving birth has to do with the manifestation. There is conception. When a child is born, it's not that he's created at the time he's born, but it's a manifestation. And that's what it's saying here. We have to understand the Hebrew properly. See, Messiah is always. He, he pre-exists all things. In fact, there was never a time that he did not exist. He is the eternal son of God. But here we see him being manifested on that day. And notice the context. It is God proclaiming him as king, anointed him, manifesting him for the purpose, if we go back up to verse, verse 5, we see in and through his judgment, his anger, his wrath. Now move to verse 8. Ask for me, this is God speaking, ask for me and I will give the Gentiles, and this would be the nations, as your inheritance and as your possession, the ends of the earth. Now, once again, we see parallelism here. We see goyim and afse arts, the nations and the end of the earth. And then we see, excuse me, then we see the term for inheritance and possessions. Your inheritance, your possession. Now, what do you possess? The inheritance, we see the similarity. Once again, synonyms to teach us biblical truth. And once more, when is going this, when is this going to take place? What's the key? Well, we move back to a verse that speaks of God's wrath, his judgment. Look carefully at, at verse, verse 9. Te ro em barzel. Now, this one, te ro em, you, speaking to Messiah, you will, most Bibles will say, you will break them with a rod of iron or a staff of iron. But here's the problem. When you do a good study of that word, it's the word where we get the, the word evil from. What is evil? Evil is not God's will. You need to make a note of that. Every time we find that word ra, and this is in the verbal form, so it's not a noun, but it speaks about doing evil. What is that? We can't think of that in the English concept of evil, meaning this. God says, I will bless you or I'll 
curse you. Blessing, tov, is good. Curse, ra, is bad. It's not what God wants. God's desire is that no one perish, but all receive everlasting life. That is his will. But that does not mean all people are going to repent and receive everlasting life. But God does not will anyone for, for punishment. That's not his desire. God does not create someone and says, I have created you and you have no hope. I will not allow you to repent. I will not allow you to come to faith. I will not allow you to respond to the gospel because I have made you solely, solely for the purpose of judging you. And some people wrongly interpret what it says in the book of Romans. When in the book of Romans, we have to see how one becomes a vessel of God's wrath to manifest his glory. Don't, don't understand something out of its context. So when we study here, it says that he is going to discipline. That's the context. Now, why do I say that? Because if you look here, it says, and you basically will do evil to them with the rod of iron as a potter's vessel, a vessel of creation, a creator is them. What's that? You will, it's a word for an explosion. Think some of your Bibles may say dash them to pieces. It means to explode, explode them, to cause them to explode, to be no more. And God does not take delight in that. It is not what he says is good. Is it right? Yes, it is. It is right for him to punish sinners. It is right for them to be eternally condemned. But God takes no delight in that, and that's not his will from the beginning. He did not predestine anyone. He knew that there would be. He knew the thoughts of us before we were even created. But God did not predetermine this. So he's saying here, it's not good. This, what's happening, is not something that he finds pleasure in, but it's the right thing. Verse 10. And now, and that's exactly what it says. And now, kings, be wise and be disciplined, the judges of the earth. Now, would you not agree that judges of the earth, Shoftei Aretz and Malachim, they're parallel with one another. In the same way that it says, be wise and, you could say, be disciplined. It's a word for being instructed. It has to do with, with being admonished. So he says, now's the time. Don't rebel. Don't plot. Don't conspire. Don't use your resources against me. He says, now, O kings, be wise and be instructed. Accept the discipline, O judges of the earth. And if one does that, what can be the outcome? Look at verse 11. Ivdu et Hashem be yirah, which means worship or serve the Lord with fear. One who is wise, who has accepted the instruction of God, they are going to worship the Lord with fear. And they are going to rejoice with trembling. Now, notice we see fear and trembling parallel to one another, as likewise, we find that, that worship and rejoicing. Now, what do we learn from that? We learn that when we worship what the Scripture is telling us, the outcome of that is joy. When we begin to worship God and serve God, we're going to be made joyful before Him. So that's why parallelism is so important and helps us to rightly pull out from the text what God is teaching us. And then one of the most controversial verses in the book of Psalms, verse 12. Nashku var. Now what does that mean? Well, the word nashika is a word for kiss. Now if you look at the rabbinical translations, 
they will say nashku bar, and they will take the term for kiss, which is an act of, of adoration, and they will take the word bar and say, well, it is an adjective that speaks about something that is pure, describes something that is pure or natural. So instead of saying, kiss the sun, which is an act of obedience, homage, submissiveness, they will translate it worship. But nowhere do we see that being rendered for this word nashku. It's kiss the sun, and we see a few times. They will tell you bar is Aramaic. It is. It makes its way into Aramaic, but it also has a Hebrew meaning. We talk about bar mitzvah, son of the covenant. So it clearly says here, worship the son or kiss the son, lest he be angry. Now, when we look at this, when we say simply worship in purity, lest he be angry, and you, and his plural, perish in your way, the whole emphasis is on this son. Who is this bar? It is Messiah. So he's telling us that if we don't want to receive judgment and wrath, to, to receive that which God doesn't want us to have and to be annihilated, to be dashed to pieces, pay homage, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you, and it's plural, you all perish. How? In the way. Four will burn just a little his anger. Meaning this, if one repents, if one turns now, then this judgment, it's going to pass quickly for such individuals because they're going to have eternity. Now, I would say that this psalm has great implications for, for the Jewish people in the last days. Because even though they are going to be in this world for what's called Jacob's trouble, Jacob's tribulation, where it says, et sarah Yaakov, a, a time of trouble for Jacob. But that time of trouble is going to be small, only, mayat, only for a moment. Because in the end, God is going to bring about salvation for that remnant in the last days. And then he says, happy or blessed are all who trust. Literally, that is the word for take refuge in him. Now, here's what's interesting. Remember when we talk about how important grammar truly is? When we look at just verse 12, if we say worship and purity, lest God be angry and you perish in the way, for his anger burns only for a moment. Blessed are all who takes refuge in him. Who's the in him? See, the problem is if you say it's just worship, purity. No, the one who we take refuge in is Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. So that's why the context demands that we translate it, kiss the Son. Bar refers to Messiah. It is a synonym for what we saw up in verse 7 where it says, The Lord said unto me, My son are you. This is the word beni from ben. So we have two words, ben and bar, being used, both referring to Messiah. And we see the nature of Psalm 2 is to show synonyms in order to reveal the same reference. And when we notice the parallelism of that reference, we see where the teaching, the revelation, where the conclusion, the right interpretation is drawn from the text. So my hope is, but through this short study of Psalm 2, we learn a little bit of theology, 
We have our doctrines more sharpened into correct views. And we also learn more about how to properly discern revelation from the text using literary devices like parallelism that are clearly discernible in the text. See, one of the great things about studying the Psalms is that the Psalms teach us. As we go through more and more, you're going to just inherently learn better how to rightly interpret the Word of God. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.